Is there just no form of travel that's safe anymore? I ask you, am I going to wind up changing wooden wagon wheels on the side of the road for my covered wagon because that is the only way that I could see myself getting around in this dangerous, violent world? Howdy. I'm Jeff Goldsmith, and this is the Q&A. My agenda is simple. Each week, I plan to bring you in-depth insights into the creative process of storytelling. And folks, I am very pleased today to have the most dangerous form of travel possible, the bullet train. Don't don't buy a ticket to the bullet train, kids. It's very dangerous. But with us is writer Zach Okowitz, and uh, he had a lot to say. This is a very complicated movie to write because there are so many different character plot lines, backstories, and mechanizations going on by people pulling the strings for all these puppets, as it turns out. Yes, you'll hear me use the word mechanizations a lot because that's what's going on here. It's a cool movie. It, there's a lot of stuff going on. It's interesting just to even hear how Zach writes action on the page. And he was very forthcoming about his creative process and what it took to get this film made. So I know you'll dig this episode. Of course, I would love to thank today's sponsor, ScreenCraft. You know, breaking into Hollywood as an aspiring writer can be a confusing, convoluted business. Fortunately, ScreenCraft helps writers with both the craft of writing and the business of filmmaking. ScreenCraft.org has everything for your writing journey, from lectures from your favorite writers like Tony Gilroy and J.J. Abrams, to hands-on career consultative coaching with their writer development team. The genre-specific screenwriting competitions feature judges that include Oscar-winning screenwriters and top literary reps that really know their storytelling. That's why hundreds of past winners and finalists have started their career with the direct support of ScreenCraft. Case in point, take the example of Shiwani Srivastava. After placing in the ScreenCraft comedy competition, the ScreenCraft team not only helped Shiwani develop her script, but pitched and ultimately sold the script to Netflix and also introduced her to her literary manager at Affirmative Entertainment. Wedding Season has since been produced by Ron Howard's Imagine Entertainment and is among Netflix's top titles across the globe. So if you're an aspiring writer, don't wait. Check out ScreenCraft over at ScreenCraft.org. And of course, while you're surfing around online, I hope you also check out Backstory Magazine. We just turned 10. That's right. We survived a decade and we couldn't have done it without your help. And the other good news is that we just released a new issue. Yes, issue 47, our summer issue is live and there is so much great stuff in it. I hope you check out the table contents to see it all. But we have Emmy Awards contenders ranging from Stranger Things, Better Call Saul, Station Eleven, Bear hacks and what we do in the shadows to summer movies to new scripts for you to read to an interview with director john carpenter on the 40th anniversary of the thing man there are so many great things in this issue and i hope you check it out if you have never read us before you can of course test drive us over at backstory.net and read the free issue or you could use the ipad app backstory where you could read the free issue there as well. And if you like what you see, and I hope you do, you could consider becoming a subscriber. And to sweeten the deal, I want to give you discount coupon code SAVE5. That will save you $5 off a one-year subscription. The code will work at backstory.net and you enter it there in your checkout card, but it'll give you access to both backstory.net and the iPad app as well. So, you know, it's two for one. You get access to both easily. But look, it would really mean a lot to me to have my podcast listeners and iTunes and Spotify Spotify and my YouTube watchers of the Backstory Magazine YouTube channel, which is all these Zoom casts go of these interviews. So you could see us do the interviews. You don't have to just hear us, but it would really mean a lot to me to have you subscribe to my passion project. So thanks for considering. But now without any further ado, let's jump right into our conversation with screenwriter Zach Okowitz about his latest film, Bullet Train, which by the way, is still in theaters and coming onto digital and on demand soon. It's Olkowitz. 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 Well, so Zach, it's good to see you. How's it going, man? It's great. How are you doing, dude? Good. I dug a bullet train and we're going we're gonna to talk about it. But first, I want to give people a sense of who you are and, and where you come from and, and what you've studied in the past. I think an easy place to start would be your father, Walter Olkowitz, is an actor, uh, ranging from Spielberg's 1941, which is a movie that I dearly love, um, even though it's completely wrong in so many ways, to, you know, Jacques Renault on Twin Peaks. Yeah. Uh, and so growing up 
having a father as an actor, is that kind of what gave you the the film bug? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think my my dad was somebody who very thoroughly loved film in, in every form. And I think that just seeing his love and seeing his dedication to it and and then to the more practical sense of growing up in trailers <laughs> and right. reading all of the uh, discarded scripts for uh, movies he didn't get, uh, I think really, really helped that kind of solidify in my mind. Did you find yourself reading a lot of scripts growing up? Because that yeah. is cool. Yeah, I love scripts. And I think it, it was really helpful because I feel like it's it's a lot different kind of as a writing form than than just traditional writing or prose writing. So I think having that little bit of a leg up was, was always great. What was a script that you remember reading of something that your dad didn't get that really struck you? Like something that made you think, I might want to be a writer one day. Oh, man. Uh, the main one I remember that I, I do not want to say this is the thing that made me want to be a writer, but okay. uh, you did not get one of the roles in the Ace Ventura sequel. Oh, um, but I remember as a kid, just at that age, just really, really not only loving, you know, reading the script, but also seeing what had changed from the script to finally, like when I saw the movie in theaters. And I think that was a really big kind of moment for me to realize that it's not as simple as just you write a story and then somebody goes out and shoots it and <laughs> you're done at the end of the weekend. Well, so did you study writing growing up or, or in college? No, I, I, funny enough, I actually went to school for video game design. That Interesting. Where'd you, where'd you go for that? I went to the Art Institute down in, uh, down in San Diego. And yeah, I, I kind of always wanted to be a writer. I thought at the time I wanted to be a video game writer and then realized I liked playing video games a lot more than I think I would have liked writing for video games. <laughs> um, right. So I kind of then just kind of segued back into where I'd always kind of started, which is, you know, film and and TV. I mean, it's interesting because, you know, the WGA finally got into the video game biz and made it an actual award, you know, like because they unionized certain video games and the writing of them. And it is a viable path, but it is still the Wild West in the video game industry. Do you, do you remember what made you you get out of it? There's there's a lot of reasons, but but what made you decide to really kind of put that behind you and go for film full force? I mean, honestly, I, I think a, a pretty big part of it is that the, the path that was kind of the most viable to me at the time, um, and this was before Last of Us, before a lot of those had kind of like come out and really started pushing narrative to the forefront. Kind of the main way to do it was, you know, you become an artist or you become start working kind of down below and you kind of work your way up to the place where you can kind of get onto those teams that are coming up with those stories. And I am a much, much better writer than I am a video game artist. So <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm not entirely sure that would have worked out in my favor. If somebody were to look on IMDb, your first produced credit is Bullet Train. But tell us about kind of breaking in and getting into you know, a place where you could be adapting the novel. Yeah, I mean, it, it's funny because from the place you go where you get where you finally get signed and all those things and and how much work you end up doing and how many projects you work on that end up kind of falling by the wayside or kind of going other things um, are so, so many <laughs> um, that right. I've been. I've been really, really lucky in that I, I feel like I've, I've worked pretty consistently since when I kind of first switched over into writing full time, I did uh, coverage for a really long time. I'm basically like for a, a tracking board website where, where writers in Iowa would send me their scripts for 30 bucks and I would give them notes. And which, which one? I, I don't think I'm allowed to say. Oh, okay. Okay. It was a really, really good experience, honestly, because I think that you know, even though I curl up into a fetal ball at the thought of doing coverage now, the chance to kind of go through people's scripts and like honestly have to consider it as a story and kind of look at it and go, okay, well, how can I look at this and how can I approach it in a way that what are the things that would have to change for this to, to be considered by a studio and be made was really, really good practice for what it's actually like, I feel like working in the industry, which is, you know, there's a lot of times where, you know, you kind of have the, the the best creative option taken away for any kind of number of reasons. And you have to figure out how to kind of make it work and, and have the story not completely fall apart. A lot of writers have had that as an experience. I, I did coverage in college, you know, as an intern. And, and, it, and it is a good way to see that you can't be precious with your own material either, because at the end of the day, somebody needs to basically stake their job by saying that your script should be made. Yeah. And, you know, their entire reputation needs to write on that. So it, it it's kind of a bigger deal than some writers think that, you know, oh, my script's perfect. Like, no, it needs to be firing on pretty much all pistons because those tires are going to get kicked a lot before millions of dollars are thrown at it. So it, it is a good experience to, to have and probably, I'm guessing, made you better as a person for taking constructive criticism notes rather than being personally offended by them because you had given them, right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's funny because there's a lot of people who, you know, I would give notes to and I'd be like, you know what, in my opinion, as the person you paid 30 bucks to, like, I don't think this thing works or I think you have to change this or this could be a better way to go at it. And, and people would get 
really a lot of the times people would get really defensive and i'd be like dude i don't matter <laughs> like just don't listen that's totally fine like you know but but if you get to a place where you are lucky enough to be working in this industry like you're going to get to a place where you're going to be getting notes from people who do matter that you probably won't agree with and you can't necessarily like it's not that you can't fight back but but you know you have to figure out ways to make that work and the, the thing i always kind of use as as the big example the really famous example is like the shark not working in jaws you know like how do you take this thing that is a really negative thing and how do you make it into something that's strength of what you're working on as opposed to letting it kind of drag one thing down right i mean and they made it the fear of the unknown since they couldn't show the shark as much so you know they use the weakness as a strength absolutely yeah. tell us about your first produced film which is fear street part two 1978 for netflix which was you know great the whole series was was really smart and you know was was there anything that came close to being made before that or what led to fear street part two i had a lot of things you know i was really lucky in that i i got to work with a lot of really big directors kind of throughout that process not just on fear street but before that you know i've, I've been really lucky in that i've done a few projects with james wan at this point and i've uh, gotten to work with michael bay in another project i worked with sam raimi on a different project and these are all projects that didn't go yeah these are all projects that didn't what, go what was the sam raimi project just as i'm a long time fan it was this project called behind that basically he was executive producing for this short film basically creator who kind of brought it to to his company and wow wrote a, wrote a project but it it was funny because it, it was i really really loved the script and and i love the director and it, it kind of got to this place where when we turned in the first draft to Lionsgate, this was only a couple a couple years ago it was right when a similar a, a movie came out that was doing really really well that explored very similar themes and just by definition of what it was was doing it better oh man <laughs> though it became this thing and then like you know covid was happening and all this stuff was kind of kicking off because that was one of my more recent projects and it just became this thing where that was just one of the you know when they were tightening their belts that was one of the the things that got got tightened which it just happens you know it's it's funny because because as a writer especially as a feature writer you are the, a lot of times one of the first people kind of like in the door working on these projects and unfortunately that means there are very very many steps after you yeah where things can go wrong and, and have absolutely nothing to do with you absolutely you know, I've, been, I've been on a few projects where you know i've turned in a script to the studio and they've been really excited about it and really happy and then a year passes and you're like we would think what happened with that like and just some producer left or some executive left or some you know director had to had a schedule conflicts or anything like that it ends up kind of like just falling by the wayside and i've also had projects you know that were kind of from earlier on in my career now pick up steam for other reasons you know people who read the script and like the script and stuff like well that. obviously in picking up steam with something like bullet train being produced you know with such an amazing cast and and you know and such a great looking film that that hopefully will reactivate some of your other projects as well yeah hopefully because you know I, I think that one of the really really hard things as a writer is you kind of have to come in and fully give your heart and you know really care about these characters and these stories and all these things and then you kind of have to figure out a way to put it in a drawer <laughs> and go work on something else because because it's just honestly in features like i said it's it's a little different in tv but you, you don't have as much control over it after that point well what was your biggest lesson from having fear street 1978 produced and then we'll get straight to bullet train what was what was your biggest lesson as a writer that maybe even helped inform your process for bullet train fear street was was a really interesting process because Chernin um, was actually developing it at the time and they kind of had this big idea that they were going to do basically a writer's room, but for uh, features. So I was one of the writers that got brought in with like five or six other writers. It was under Adam Wingard at the time was kind of the, the person who was, who was okay. kind of up. and we sat in a room for a month and we cracked this trilogy and kind of like the way it was, it was, it was really cool and really fun and a really awesome experience. And then at some point kind of after that, uh, Adam left because he went to do uh, Godzilla versus Kong, which was a good choice on his work. Sure. <laughs> and, you know, then, and then Lee Janiak came on, who's incredible and we ended up kind of i want to say re recontextualizing a lot of kind of what we had and figuring out like a different because she came in with a really really clear idea of what she wanted to do and it had no fault with with adam's version or the version that we kind of cracked but it just we had to kind of re-break all of the stories in a sense to kind of like push into what she wanted to do and so we, we had another writer's room <laughs> where i was uh one of the only writers who kind of came back and, and was able to do that i got to write another brand new script <laughs> with uh wow 
almost like a like a remix of what I'd written before because it was very similar to what it was, but it was just like kind of coming from a different place and exploring different kind of genres. Well, it's and, kind of good that you had that as like your first draft iteration to build upon. Yeah, and it, it's I, I honestly think that we worked so hard in that first room that I think we kind of cracked a lot of the themes and story elements that really helped us have a place to go when we then were throwing out whole sections and throwing out stuff and kind of figuring out how to push it. And I think that one of the big things I honestly learned in the fear shoot process, and this, this hundred percent comes from Lee, which is just that she had such a strong idea of what she wanted the theme to be and what she wanted the meta story to kind of be of this idea of like, you know, the poor kids versus the rich kids. And this idea that like, as teenagers, no one kind of believes you and you like, what does that look like? And, and how can you personify that? across a trilogy that it was honestly really, I don't want to say easy because easy is not the right word, but it, it was really fun to go back and rewrite because it was always an opportunity to push it into those themes. Like how can we kind of take this opportunity to kind of keep pushing it and kind of make it better. And I've been on projects uh, since and before that where we didn't necessarily have that really clear theme. And you get to a place where you're like rewriting dialogue or something really simple and you can find yourself just bashing your head against the wall because you don't have that clear target to kind of go after as to like, well, how can I be be making this better? You're just kind of like, you know, shifting stuff around or, or changing the color of the couch in a room because you're like, is this is this making it better? Is this <laughs> and, and theme is kind of invisible sometimes if done right. But but, you know, ha the audience has the feeling of it. So it's it's very hard to tackle. And if you're writing without it at all, you're going to feel a little light, I think would be the way to say it. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's that's a really good way to say it, because I, I think that it, at best, you know, theme should be invisible in a sense. You know, you should be really caught up in the plot of what's going on and really caught up in what's, you know, the the, the plight of the characters and, and kind of tracking what's happening in each scene. But at the same time, you know, I think audiences are, are really savvy in picking up that kind of stuff, even if they're not aware they're doing it. All right. Well, now I'm excited to talk about the theme for Bullet Train. So we can't talk about it yet because we're still in the spoiler free section. Tell us how you got the gig. I mean, because that's that's a that's a really top gig to get at that point. I'm guessing had Fear Street even coming out yet when when you got it or was it going into production? Fear Street had not come out yet, but I will fully credit uh, Brittany Morrissey over at Sony, who basically we kind of met on a few things when she before she went to Sony. And we're kind of always trying to find something to work on. And she originally had kind of found the book and had been championing the book and, and trying to kind of figure out a way to get made. And originally it was with Anson Fuqua to direct. So she sent it over and, and I really responded to it and really responded to the themes. What year was this when she sent it over to you? Yeah, I guess it would have been 2018. Yeah, so she she sent it over and I really responded to it. So, you know, with any kind of assignment work, you know, basically I came in and I pitched uh, Antoine and I pitched Kat Samick, his, his producer, and Brittany. And we kind of just figured out a version that I think was was really exciting and they really responded to my take so i ended up getting the job and then going off and writing the draft well so let's let's talk about you know your your creative habit you know you're you're adapting a book so technically there's one iteration of the story that's done how did you break down the book into an outline i've worked on a few different kinds of adaptations over the years and one of the biggest things i kind of start with is that the perfect version of this as a book exists. <laughs> so nothing about what I'm doing is trying to compete or one up or anything that version, because I think that version is great. It, you know, it's the same way if you're adapting, you know, or I mean, a rebooting movie or, or anything else. It's like, how do you take those themes and take the things that really resonated with you as a writer? And how do you take those things and find new ways to kind of come at them so with this book in particular it's really complicated <laughs> and there's kind of a lot a lot going on and i think anybody who's read the book and seen the movie will know a lot of the best parts of my script came from the book and came from kind of what asaka had already kind of done so i think it was a lot of kind of like sitting down and I, i'm a huge outline uh twice right once kind of guy so you know, I, I outlined a ton and I kind of set up all the moments that I felt like were really, really important to the story and like that I really felt like people who read the book would be really excited to see. And then kind of took a step back and went, well, okay, what can we do to like tighten this up? You know, because we've got two hours, not, you know, however many pages to kind of tell the story. Like, how can we make changes that are going to heighten the theme that he was trying to tell? And how can we push those things as opposed to kind of like, I think the worst kind of crime you can ever do when you're adapting something is having it feel like a book report on the thing that you're doing. Right. Absolutely. Well, so what was your design document like? Were, were you just typing in word, you know, with, with bullet points or did you 
delineate between act one, two, or three? Did you use note cards? Tell us about that. I kind of started with a, I have a big whiteboard in my office. Um, so I started with a whiteboard and it slowly started looking like I was tracking a serial killer across the Midwest with all of the like ribbons going everywhere to make sure I was tracking each, each individual part. And then I normally outline um, entirely in Word. Like that's, that's how I outline. I, I have a pitch document because it, it, it's easier for me to see it. Um, with this, I actually got to a place where I outlined in Excel because it just was a lot easier to track because I needed to be able to look at each of the individual threads and each character and even down to like where the briefcase was in every scene and where the snake was and like all of these individual elements and kind of I needed to be able to look at it and see, okay, where are we at in the movie? And then where are these things actually in relation to each other and, and make sure those made sense, but also kind of make sure that those individual little arcs were kind of paying off in the ways that I wanted them to. All right. I, I've interviewed a lot of writers. I haven't really heard anybody doing it this way, but so I'm really intrigued. How would you use your, your different columns? Like, what would they be like? Just would it be the characters here? And then it would go across horizontally as to what yeah. happens next? Or is it from top to bottom, the story moving forward with notes on the side going horizontal? It was literally going left to right with the movie. And then each column down would be the characters as we saw them. So like, oh, yeah. it'd be like Lemon and Tangerine here. And then like, if they disappear, it would skip a couple scenes to when they showed back up. But it just gave me the ability to kind of look at it in a row and be like, okay, without distracting myself with all the other characters and all the other things that are going on, like, this is what their story is. And this is how it, how it kind of works. Interesting. Um, and I don't normally do that to be clear. It was only just because this is such a, a complicated, uh, you know, kind of, kind of plot that so did you have like, seen numbers across the top for each scene. No, it, it was honestly kind of just more broken down into uh, events. Cause, cause the way I kind of look at, at plot, especially in that kind of sense is I feel like every few pages, you should have something that alters what you thought you were watching. You know, like have something that kind of changes the plot in a way that like, oh, now it's this. Oh, now it's this. And like, so I kind of tracked those big movements across the top and then just kind of went through and kind of tweaked it. And the really good thing about Excel that I really like, and this is actually funny enough from back at the time when I was thinking about going to video games, they were writing a lot of their video game kind of writing documents in Excel. Interesting. It's easier to put 500 lines of dialogue in one yeah. column to, to kind of figure it out. Huh. I might, I might want to see uh, screenshots of that and maybe put it on the backstory website. I mean, if the, if the studio says, okay, cause that's fascinating. I mean, there is a function in final draft that you could do slug lines for scenes and have these little note cards that give you more room than a note card. And then they could also be converted into a rough outline of a script. It's like part of, part of the new software. So that's the closest I could get, but that's fascinating. That's very, that's very interesting. Well, so when you sit down to write, how long do you, give yourself on a typical day? Do you go for a specific page count or for a specific amount of time when you write each day? You know, I, I think my answer before I had children and after I had children would be very different. Sure. <laughs> I think now that I, I have two small kids, it's a lot of kind of like, how do I have my writing time and how do I protect that writing time? And it's a lot less kind of about like, how do I get stuff done and more, how do I make sure I'm staying focused? I'm, I'm a very big proponent of the idea that a lot of your best writing comes when you're not writing. And I used to figure out more stuff taking walks with my wife than I would necessarily when I was sitting around kind of hammering it out on a keyboard. And I think that giving yourself that kind of space to do that is really, really, really important to the process. And I think it's also, you know, being accountable to yourself to when you're not actually, you don't actually need to do that anymore. And you're just kind of procrastinating at that point. And, and knowing the difference, I don't think anybody knows, but... <laughs> Okay. Tell me this. How long did it take to get your first draft? It honestly took longer than I think it probably would have on, on something else. I feel like there was definitely a point where uh, the studio was kind of like, okay, like we're getting a draft, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, you know, I, I was able to kind of turn it in. I, I could not even tell you, I, I want to say if I had, to, if I was pushed to answer, I'd say like six months or something like that. Okay. But that's pretty good. At the time I turned it in, Anton was still um, really excited to kind of dive in and, and kind of do it. And then I think it just got to a place where he kind of had to choose between going off and doing uh, infinite or doing this. So he stayed on as a, as a producer and they kind of went out to different directors to figure That's out right. who, could, who could kind of come in. And uh, I am not privy to any of those things. So as far as I know, <laughs> the first choice I always picked who was going to do it. David, you know, I don't think you could write an action movie right now and not hope that David Leach responds. So 
it was it was pretty exciting when he when he came on board and responded. When he came on board, were there any major things that needed to be changed? Like, did you go through a rewrite stage with David? Honestly, there's 500 different versions of the script in my mind, so it's always remembering which one was at what stage. He was kind of. And I don't want to go into spoilers, but but a lot of the third act and kind of like how it ends up playing out was something he kind of came up with. And kind okay, of- you know what? How about this? Because because you're right. It's it's almost impossible at this point to avoid spoilers. So podcast listeners and iTunes and Spotify and watchers of this Zoom cast over on the Backstory Magazine YouTube page, if you have not yet seen Bullet Train, press pause, go see it. It's still in theaters. And it'll be coming to digital and VOD soon as well. And then resume because we're fully going to talk about the spoilers. So tell us as, as we get into the spoiler section, what you wanted to say about David, because one of the one of the major changes from the book was the introduction of White Death as the big bad guy. Was that something that didn't happen until David came on or was that something that you were already toying with? That was something that I kind of brought to the pitch because because the book has a much more kind of like everything kind of just unfolds and it's very much about fate in the sense of like, all of this is a little random, like why this came together. And the White Death was a character I kind of ensued because I just I was like, I, I want to have a third act. Like I want to not have this thing end on kind of like a whimper or anything. I wanted to have this kind of bad guy we could have literally at the end of the line in this case. So essentially you wanted more of a puppet master than the character of the prince. Well, originally in my draft, my first draft that I turned in, the prince was the one who kind of brought everybody there. And right, which is very close it. to the book. Exactly. And it was all kind of in service of trying to to take down the White Death. It's tricky to kind of do that in the way that we had kind of broken everything down. So one of David's big ideas was a way to kind of clean that up was to have the White Death. And he just, I think he really wanted that kind of big aha, like, this is a cool reveal kind of like third act moment, uh, which I think worked really well. Yeah, that was something we did in the first kind of pass before even going out to talent, I think was was having white death kind of be the one who was who was behind it all. Well, then there's obviously, as you just were leading into a rewrite that you get when you go out to talent. So, you know, when when Brad Pitt and Plan B came on, what were some of the things that changed about Ladybug's character? It wasn't in a sense that like Brad came on and was like, oh, here's my notes or here's this or here's how I want to change it. Brad came on and I feel like was just fully game for everything he wanted to do from the start. But he came in just and brought himself to it. Like every aspect of the berry and the therapy and all of that stuff is not in my draft. All of that was from him basically kind of being like, this is who I think this character is. And that's who I'm going to be on day one. And a lot of because I was I was really lucky in that I got to be on set while while we were filming and I feel like a lot of that was kind of like seeing what the actors were kind of bringing up and what they were improving and how they was kind of making that work and how can we kind of basically see that throughout the rest of the scripts and make it feel like it's on purpose. <laughs> yeah, was this shot before the pandemic or during the pandemic? It was during because it was during the pandemic. We had not had a a vaccine yet. Okay. So they shot it entirely on the Sony lot, which literally we had these like little pods that we could face masks. And I actually felt safer when I was filming than any other time because we were getting tested like daily. (laughs) Yeah. And that's Uh, great. Yeah. Honestly, I I don't, we had like a little bit of a a scare if I remember right, but honestly there was no shutdowns. There was no one got sick really. And that's fantastic. It was, it was a small miracle. I think one thing I want to talk about, there's this, there's this old theory that's kind of called short film theory of storytelling in which it's a movie within a movie at different points. You know, the, the most common one that people would equate is the gold watch in Pulp Fiction right? You're, you're getting away for a second from your main drive and your main story, but you're now actually finding out why Bruce Willis is just so absolutely bent on getting this watch back when it's going to, you know, cause a lot of harm to him possibly and how important it is. And that's something that really kind of came into bullet train all over the place. I mean, whether it's the wolf sunglasses and how he got them to props all over the movie that have different iconic meanings to different characters. What was it like to kind of show that on the page and to kind of get into how much you're going to be focusing on certain props in the movie? We see zoom ins, we see close ups, but then you could also argue that writers are told sometimes to not overdo it with calling attention to certain shots on the page. So there's this hybrid, obviously you coming from video game writing would know that we need to know enough information, but at the same time, you don't want the read to be completely cluttered down with too much camera direction. So tell us about kind of the mini movie storytelling style, along with how much attention you were calling out 
in a pre-production draft versus a production draft? My big thing is I don't think any rule is worthwhile unless it's helping you make a better script. So like the idea of not having camera direction or having camera direction, I think that if, and, and something you pointed out, I think is really true, which is that you are first writing a script for the read and yeah. then you're writing a script to be made. And when you're writing a script for the read, I really think that anything that helps the movie or uh, come off better and helps people see it better and helps people enjoy it more is, is helpful. And I don't personally think like, however you want to write it, then, then do it. Like people will love it. You know, I, of I course. There's, there's plenty of people who, who write ways that I could not necessarily write who break all the rules in the book to, to kind of make that, that fun. In the case of this, it, it was honestly just kind of like, how do I make sure people are tracking the things that they need to track to the, to the level that I feel like the audience will track it. And I think there's a lot of kind of modulation on that where you kind of like put too much in and then you have to go back or you don't put enough in. And it's, it takes a lot of fine tuning. And I think in the script specifically, a lot of the work on it was kind of that fine tuning of like, how do we make sure people are, because, you know, a lot of times the executives or producers are like, whoever's reading it, they're reading it in a stack of scripts that they're reading over a weekend and reading right. other things. So you kind of have to make sure that if they are half reading or their kids are yelling at them or anything else is happening, that they're picking up all the really important things. A lot of people will tell you not to do this. I, I bold, like I really like bolding. And I think uh, I also, you know, overcapitalize to an annoying degree so do you bold only on action moments or do you bold on props or do you just bold indiscriminately it basically goes like normal text is if you miss this but capitalized is if you're skimming and you're only reading the capitalized words i think you should understand what's happening and bolded is if you miss this part you're gonna have to go back in five pages and go wait how did, what happened and i kind of just go up on that scale based on how i think it should be but it's all to the to the extent i feel like i'm just trying to make the read as interesting as possible and again to make it feel like you're watching the movie because that's that's ultimately what everybody's hoping for you know you, you you have success in writing a really great script and the best case scenario is people are watching it they're not reading what you wrote anyway so how do you get to that place i mean it has a very distinctive style it's you know david's style could be seen all throughout these elaborate whimsical fights how much of that was was engineered on the page, like even in the early drafts before he came on versus collaborating with him and possibly a stunt coordinator and especially a storyboard artist or previs. Tell us about kind of reworking the script if you, if you actually did when those phases were hitting. I'll go back even further. And when I when I first kind of started, I love action. You know, I, I really love, and I, and I have a really good idea. I think of like what action's good, what action's bad. I kind of look at Steven Spielberg in a way of, of the ultimate kind of action director because he does this thing where every action in a scene affects what comes after it. So you can't take a punch out and put it anywhere in the scene because it's like it's it's Indy swinging the blocks of the plane and hitting the guy. So now the plane's spinning and like all these things kind of lead into one thing or another. So I really like writing action. I think I have a lot of fun with it. And one of the first big scripts I got a chance to work on was this action script that it ended up not getting made with James Wan. And he read the scripts and he was like, this is incredible. Take all the action out because I'm not going to do any of that. <laughs> because, you know, he, he's going to shoot and do it kind of his own way. So I feel like I started getting to a place where I was like, okay, well, how do you hit that medium ground of making sure the story of the fight is coming across without talking about punches? You know, without without going to any of that kind of detail, how do you go into like who's winning and who's losing and how are you tracking that, that kind of growth? And then as far as with David is concerned, I would come up with stuff that I thought was really, really cool. And then he would uh, just up it in every degree. And then he'd send me previs of people in cardboard warehouses you know, doing the coolest shit I've ever imagined. But even like just the way that they're fighting with props, you know, using the tabletops, using you know the laptops the briefcase like it could be really cluttered on the page if you're not careful and could slow down the read was there anything that you learned along the way for writing your action to keep it flowing but also to keep a very good sense of of some of the quirkiness that really comes through in the movie that i'm sure also came from previs and other pieces of the puzzle down the line yeah i mean honestly i i think it's it's kind of back to what i was saying earlier which is what are the details that you could put in that will help this, you know, read better? And that gives you the feeling of what that fight is. You know, for instance, the fight that Ladybug has with Lemon over the in the quiet car. I don't think I wrote in my initial draft, I don't think I wrote a lot of what that was. I think I just said they fight. 
you know, or they, they, they fight, but it's, it's over a tabletop. So it's awkward and kind of weird. <laughs> you know, Interesting. Was, okay. So, so you did do just a brief version. A lot of the time. Yeah. Okay. But then, like, for instance, in the, um, the, the 17 kills montage, cause I, I literally had to kind of beat out every single one and be like, how is this elevating in a way that's interesting? And how are we kind of tracking this? And how is, you know, it, it getting to this really insane place? And how are you getting character moments out of these, these kind of beats with, you know, the, the reveal that like, uh, lemons miscounting and like what that means for them and stuff like that oh hey kids i'm jumping in really quick to remind you that backstory just turned 10 that's right we've made it a decade we're here we've survived and we couldn't have done it without your help and uh you know we want to keep doing it so your support means everything to us and now is a perfect time to subscribe because we just released our big summer issue that's right we have emmy contenders ranging from stranger things Barry, Better Call Saul, What We Do in the Shadows, Station Eleven, and Hacks. We also have summer movies. We have an interview with actor Glenn Powell, who plays Hangman in Top Gun Maverick. We have John Carpenter, the director of The Thing, on its 40th anniversary. Looking back, there are so many great articles to read in backstories. Huge summer issue. There's also scripts to read. I know you'll dig it. If you've never read us before, you could, of course, test drive us by reading the free issue which you could find at backstory.net on a desktop or laptop or via our iPad app backstory. And uh, look, after you check us out and test drive us, I hope you'll consider becoming a subscriber and just to sweeten the deal. I want to offer you discount coupon code save five that save and the number five, and that will save you $5 off a one year subscription. All you got to do is enter that code at backstory.net and it'll get you access to both the iPad login and over at backstory.net net on a desktop or laptop as well. Look, it would really mean a lot to me to have my podcast listeners and iTunes and Spotify and my YouTube watchers of all these Zoom casts. That's right. You could watch us do these interviews because they were Zooms that I've put on YouTube on the Backstory Magazine YouTube page. It would really mean a lot to me to have you support my passion project. So thanks for considering becoming a subscriber. Folks, I'd also like to thank our sponsor today of ScreenCraft. As you know, breaking into Hollywood as an aspiring writer can be a confusing and convoluted business. Fortunately, ScreenCraft helps writers with both the craft of writing and the business of filmmaking. ScreenCraft.org has everything for your writing journey from video lectures with your favorite writers like Tony Gilroy and J.J. Abrams to hands-on career consultative coaching with their top writer development team. Take, for example, the experience of Shiwani Srivastava. After placing in a ScreenCraft comedy competition, she wound up collaborating with ScreenCraft, who sold her project to Netflix, and it has now been produced by Ron Howard's Imagine Entertainment and is among one of Netflix's top five titles across the globe. So if you're an aspiring writer, don't wait to check out ScreenCraft over at ScreenCraft.org. But now, without any further ado, let's jump right back into our conversation with screenwriter Zach Okowitz about his latest film, Bullet Train, which, by the way, is still in theaters and coming to digital and on demand soon. At what point did you realize that you could turn the prince from a boy into a girl, a young teen coming up that wants to prove themselves? It, it obviously was an interesting choice because as they're on the train, of course, Lemon and Tangerine taking the son back to, you know, the father, she's there to screw it up because she feels passed over and she's jealous. And so a lot of those machinations at first are coming from her and we think she's behind everything until of course we learn that the white death is behind a lot and then of course the other reveal which was really fun of the elder coming in and showing how he was a part of it as well so kind of talk about managing those three elements to lead to that ending because yes i could see why you need an excel file to do that sir it, it gets very complicated it was very complicated as far as changing prince from a, a boy to a girl that was from my original pitch that was how i kind of pitched it and it was for two reasons it was one that there's not a lot of women <laughs> and i was like i just really honestly like want to make sure this isn't just a bunch of guys like fighting and and the right. only the only female is you know you only hear her voice for 95% of it. And the other thing too, is it was just kind of looking at the character from the book because you have so much time in a book to kind of go into why they are the way they are or examples of how they are the way they are. that You just honestly don't have in, in movies. And for me, it felt like if you make her a girl, you get a lot of that context. <laughs> you just understand it. And the audience understands that because of like 
where the world is and what it's like being being a woman in any of these kind of things and it just kind of informed her character in such a way that felt so natural and honestly organic and then honestly seeing you know kind of what, what joey king did with it i i feel fully justified in that it was the right choice because i think it just you know in the book i think the character kind of comes across as kind of just crazy like he's kind of just got he's just kind of like a, a little psychopath which is is fun and fine but i think joey brought a lot of reality kind of to it so even if she you don't like her like you at least kind of get where she's coming from and and i think right. that's, that's half the battle with any kind of any kind of villain and she's um, brains rather than brute force for most of it as well so so that works too and then talk about the elder coming in you know because that was another element that was fascinating yeah the elder for me i mean that's that's definitely kind of like a distillation of of some of the plots from the book with kimura and then the elder coming in and in the book it's it's two it's it's the the they're like a husband and wife kind of like old assassins and a lot of that kind of came from the fact that when i was reading the book there's a very similar scene to when ladybug is sitting there with the elder and the elders kind of giving that speech about fate and about how like all the bad things that have happened to you in life you know you just haven't had the whole picture like they are happening to you for a reason it's just for this other reason you weren't you weren't totally aware of and that was honestly one of the the reasons that i was like i have to make this movie because i just really loved that sentiment and i really loved it as a theme kind of going forward and i normally write chronologically that was actually the first scene i wrote i felt really strongly about it and i really loved the speech and i had on i was picturing hero honestly like saying it even before he was cast and i think that storyline the kimura storyline specifically and then going into the elder and, and the past we kind of see with him in the white death that always was the heart of that movie and it's funny because like so many people talk about brad and talk about that character but like in my mind he was always like mad max and and fury road you know like he doesn't really even arc necessarily like he kind of is just along for the ride his whole point is that he's helping this other epic story have this conclusion and it's why the story begins with kimura in the hospital room right and the original draft kind of ended a little closer to when he left um because we were watching that story come to fruition our pov just wasn't those characters it was it was more from brad's character but i i love those characters and i honestly just it, it's it's hard because the movie is so jam-packed and there's so much in it that i i wish we could watch the four-hour version of it where <laughs> all, every single character got all the incredible scenes that i know were shot in the movie we were talking about theme earlier here you know you're playing with a few themes and 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 one of them definitely is fate and you know the fulfillment of revenge tell tell me some of the elements that were playing in your mind regarding theme when you were writing it and what you felt you were writing too because i could see that each character basically is on their own path thematically dealing with the fate of what at first they think are coincidences that they're all together and they soon realize is a mechanization. The big part for me was kind of the idea that all of these characters think they're in control of their own fate and the blind spot to all of them is themselves. You know, it's it's why I feel like the, the Lemon and Tangerine characters work so well is because they're in the exact same boat where they're kind of like reacting to all these things. They don't necessarily have all the information, but as the movie kind of goes on, you see that it's coming from this place of the love of these characters. And they're, they're kind of like, even though they tell themselves that the mission is the most important thing, it's like that relationship is actually the most important thing. And them caring about each other is actually the most important thing. And I think that kind of like, for me, looking at fate as this idea of how do you explore the people we think we are and we want to be with who we actually are and how can you explore that with all of these characters was really kind of where I started and kind of started looking at you know how do I kind of pull that out and get that through everybody this is a great example of ensemble writing where you are managing a lot of characters and you are really filling us in on all of them some bad development executives would tell you you have too many characters so cut hornet cut the wolf you don't need them stuff like that but you were able to keep even those characters that function in moving the story forward but have their own little backstories that you relish in telling was it difficult to hold on to stuff like that or were you able to infuse it so much in the story that it couldn't be cut because it is like a classic development question when you get into ensemble writing of how many characters are too many there's two answers to that i think that the first is that the theme of fate it, it kind of helps you keep all these characters because you have that kind of 
you know, uh, snatch kind of idea of like all these different storylines kind of crashing together. And, and the fun is that they're all kind of disjointed and there's so many things that, that the audience is kind of having to track. And then I think the other side of that is honestly just within the style, which is both the style that I feel like I kind of brought to it in the writing. So like The Wolf, for instance, the idea of doing, you know, this entire movie in like 45 seconds of like why you're seeing everything as to why this guy wants to kill Brad so badly was in my pitch. And it was because you get all of that in the book because you're reading all these chapters and you're getting to take all these pages. But how do you do that in a sense with a character you're not really going to spend that much time with and really only serves kind of the focus of or the, the point of not letting him get off the train and like how do you have that be satisfying in a way that's really fun and also kind of shows you know your themes and i just really have always responded to the idea that especially in action movies where a lot of times people can be kind of disposable or kind of throw away characters the idea that we're all in these movies we're all in these kind of like stories that our own stories and like how many things took to get us to where we are now where you're just going to be the guy that brad kills at minute 15 or whatever and i think that sony was kind of able to see that. And I think that the studio was able to kind of see that and kind of really embrace that so that it, it honestly, we never had conversations about cutting any of that stuff because I think it was both economical on the page and really helped what we were kind of going for. Who do you consider the protagonist to be if there is one? Or do you really consider it to be pure ensemble? I think that all of the characters are kind of their own protagonists. I think that, and this is honestly something that, that happened when Brad came on, I think Brad became a lot more of the POV character than necessarily it is in the book or, or in my original draft. But I think that the idea that, again, he, he's not necessarily the protagonist because he's not really, a, he doesn't affect a lot. Like he's kind of just passively kind of just trying to do his thing throughout the movie. I think that weirdly, even though he doesn't show up too really late, I think the elder is probably the protagonist. Or just very least, you know, Kimura is the protagonist because they're the ones with that kind of question of, of that thematic question of, you know, how are they going to get out of this? Like, how is he going to save his son? Like, how is he going to get revenge for his, uh, his wife? And I think every other character in a sense is almost just kind of helping that, that story reach its conclusion. Yeah. I mean, Lim and Tangerine are just absolutely great. And, you know, people at first were like, what is going on with this Thomas the Train stuff? You know, because they, they just couldn't figure it out. But you just kept building it and building it and building it till it reaches this climax when, you know, the prince constantly is trying to change her identity as she meets new people, acting like an, an innocent, you know, kidnap victim by the end of it. And, it's really just the sticker that Tangerine is able to put on her of Thomas the Tank Engine so that so that Lemon could know in that in that reveal that was like that was a huge setup and payoff that spans, you know, a very long distance in the movie. At what point did the icon of the sticker come in or or was it something from the book? That's something from the book. Um all of the Thomas the Tank the train stuff is is from the book, which was a a wrestling with that I had to do in writing that draft because it's something that I think, you know, seeing the finished product, it feels like a quirky little thing that makes it work. And I think, honestly, Brian Terry Henry is incredible, and he, he does such a good job of grounding it that you don't really question that it's kind of insane. And it was hard in the writing to have it come up naturally, to have it be a thing yeah. that felt like a part of this person who could actually operate in the real world as opposed to, you know, like somebody who maybe was not mentally all there. And their relationship was, you know, obviously one of the stronger ones in the film because we we get attached to them. So when Tangerine, you know, dies, you you feel that loss because they're they're slowly just to the point of working at you know as a team and you're you're kind of rooting for them so that that worked well what what was the left turn what was something that was on the page that you wanted to experiment with that was either something from the book that you really wanted to preserve and had to cut or something you invented that you really wanted to preserve and had to cut and when i say cut i mean wasn't even shot because we'll get into deleted scenes in a moment but just something that in your mind yeah this is definitely going to be a part of the movie for you know, a month or two of your process. And then it never even made it to production. It's hard because I feel like I was, I was there for every decision. So it's really hard to, to think back to the versions that didn't happen because they don't, they feel impossible now. Like one of the biggest examples um, is similar to the book. Uh, Lemon originally dies, like fully dies when he gets shot by Prince. And that's it, the, the end of his storyline. Part of that came from conversations with David. It was just like, you know, we really like these two characters. This is really dark. 
<laughs> we're just like killing all these people. But it was something I kind of fought for where I was like, no, I think Lemon has to die because he's such a, like, he, he's a character like people like, and he feels like the heart. Like we need to have some kind of like loss in this movie. That's not just, you know, um, characters that are more, uh, I, you know, I, at the time, Aaron hadn't been incredible. So I didn't know how much that character was going to work, but I lost that fight because, because, and for all the reasons why I think it works in the movie and, and now seeing it, and especially like with the way we kind of massaged it and, and even with like the post credit scene of him getting out of the water and all that stuff. Um, I can't picture a version where he doesn't live, you know? And, and I think that's, what's really interesting about writing, especially when you're writing at that level of writing on set and, and seeing all these kind of decisions that add up to changes that you wouldn't have considered working when you're just by yourself in a room writing and no one's giving you feedback. And now I think it honestly all ended up with with the best version of the movie. Who would have killed Prince if if it wasn't Lemon? There were so many versions of how oh, right. Prince died. I think there, you know, it was probably going to always be because I think this is it's not from the book. There's an element in the book that kind of inspired this, but getting hit by the the tangerine trunk was always kind of how she died, just because okay. of went with the, the fate theme. There was a version for a little bit that never got shot that I loved where she gets bit by the snake at the end. Um, right. I, snake on I, a train. Snake on a train. That was really, really fun. But but ultimately, we, we ended up not doing it where she kind of disappears and then she comes back almost in the post credits and it's like giving her I'm the white death speech and then just gets bit by the snake and then you cut to black. Like, that, you know, knowing what happens. That's funky. You know, by being a writer on set and being so involved, what were some of the rewrites that you found yourself doing during production? I mean, especially with a movie like this, what was hard is, is there's so many things that happen that you, again, don't have any control over. Like, I don't even remember who it was, but but somebody got hurt in one of the, the stunts. So I had to write them out of one of the other scenes. And when you're in a situation like this, where you're in a linear train where people can't get by each other without passing each other, it, it ended up introducing a lot of problems to just logically, like, how does this work? And I'm sure there's a, a Reddit thread somewhere telling me why it doesn't work. But um, <laughs> I, I think that we did it in Admiral Cup, at least uh, not having you asked those questions to laugh. Editing is the last stage of storytelling. What was something you learned about your film and the edits? And what were some of the deleted scenes that, that people might one day see on a Blu-ray or something? Answering the last question first, the, the deleted scenes, there's so much good stuff that just got cut for time. Like you could literally have a four hour cut that's just the banter between lemon and tangerine that they did in each individual thing in the little cut they're so great and they honestly were so so wonderful that i wish that that version existed because people people would really love it what's the other question sorry you know just things that you learned during the editorial process you know some some things when you have nonlinear storytelling especially so flashback heavy it gives you a modular sense of your story so certain flashbacks might be able to be toyed around with moved forward or backwards in time from where they fell in your script other things like that if if if, if that even happened you know things i learned in the edit uh there was a lot more of a sense of these are all characters who are kind of being driven by having lost somebody or who they're being driven by the people they care about in a sense and i i remember literally seeing the final cut doing like the dvd commentary and being like oh i didn't even really think about that being a big part of it but but it's really there and and again it comes through because of the how how great all the actors are and then as far as it's funny because this movie specifically when i wrote it it you went through each storyline individually so you went through Cremora and all the way to a place where he, i think he gets knocked out and then you went back and you watched lemon all the way through to where they lose the briefcase and then you finally went back and you watched brad get on the train all the way up until he gets stabbed by the the wolf so you have these three fully, fully within their viewpoint. And it was very much kind of the idea of like, you'd see them passing by the other characters and, and the fun of like seeing these scenes happening in the background that we'd already watched. But I think David very smartly and Elizabeth, the, uh, the editor, realized very quickly that watching the beginning of a movie three times in a row and <laughs> let alone getting to Brad, you know, 25 minutes in was probably not going to ever work. Interesting. Um, and it, it blows my mind, honestly, how seamless they were able to kind of like introduce all those things and have them all kind of weave together so you get all those introductions in such a short kind of time without it uh, just seeming like a lot there's this old theory that everybody knows called you know Chekhov's gun Anton Chekhov the great playwright if you see a gun in act one you're gonna see it later on used in a way that you know obviously there's going to be doom uh here your your, your Chekhov's gun concept is really wild because the prince engineers a gun that fires 
back at the person that thinks they're firing forward, it actually is going to kill them. So you just did this great setup on payoff with it and how it works. And I wasn't actually sure where you were going with it for a long time until finally she's versus her dad and her dad has her gun and is pointing it at her and she's, she's begging him to kill her. And it's like, oh, that's, that's a perfect death. That's how she's going to get back at her dad. But then even that goes wrong, right? Because maybe it's Ladybug's inclusion in the journey and he always has things go wrong with whatever he's involved with, but it doesn't work out the way she wanted it to. And the, the gun actually becomes another thing, you know, 10 minutes later when, when it finally is used. Talk about engineering that and just also set up and pay off of some of these props. Yeah, I mean, it's funny because that gun even specifically, like it changed who it killed changed so many times. Tell us <laughs> some of the iterations because I, I could totally see that. The very first draft I wrote. So the Hornet in the book is actually two assassins. Or originally, this is going to blow your mind, but like none of the crash happens. None of that happens. They actually, it all ends at Kyoto. And basically the elder goes to kind of fight the White Death and Kimura and Ladybug go to get off the train and they end up running into the conductor that's been chasing him the entire time. And it turns out that he's the partner of the Hornet. And that was actually where that gun ended up getting played. And it kind of became more a moment of Ladybug picks up a gun at some point and they kind of have this Mexican standoff. And then he knows one of them has this gun and he's kind of like, you know, I'm choosing not to pull the trigger. And the other guy ends up pulling the trigger because he doesn't want to make the choice and it, it blows up in his face. And it, it was a really, really cool scene. And it was actually a really uh, one of the, the clear ways that we had given Ladybug kind of like an arc, but it always just felt so kind of unimportant, you know, and it felt kind of, you know, not really, we're just watching this random character we didn't know about get, get killed by it, that I don't even remember how many different ways we kind of ended up with it. But when it eventually landed on, well, that's going to be the thing that ends up killing the white death. And what was really, really fun about it is I love that it's such a simple concept that you then see it not work. And then he just puts it in the back of his belt and you kind of don't think about it. And then when it comes up, you know, every, every screening I've been to, when it comes up and he finally, the gun's out of bullets and he pulls the other one, the audience like <laughs> goes nuts because they know yeah. what's about to happen. And I was always worried about that because I was like, well, are they going to track it? Which gun it was? And they, you know, are they going to really see this? Or is this, you know, is there no surprise? But it, it actually weirdly became the anticipation of the moment was better than any surprise of the moment. And that was what ended up really working about that beat. Well, just as you were playing with fate so many times, I mean, the water bottle is the other little part of the ending that, you know, you're you you gave a backstory to the water bottle. And look, I have a magazine called Backstory. I love backstories. But when I was first experiencing the first part of it, I'm like, are we really going back to the vending machine at mm -hmm. the beginning of the movie? Is this is this what we are doing for the the path of the water bottle? But I, I like it because it's it's a crazy idea. Like, it's absolutely crazy. And it and it and it thematically works with this you know, fate goes through many hands and evolves in different ways. Tell us about the evolution of that. And that was actually also in my pitch. That was something I kind of, from the start, and it, it started very much from a practical place of, will the audience track that this water bottle has sleeping powder in it? <laughs> and that was originally where that flashback kind of happened was, was when Lemon drinks it. You, uh, you see that, that kind of go back like that. As we were kind of shooting, because we were kind of rewriting the third act throughout the whole thing, it kind of got to this place where like, well, can we move that flashback to here instead? And can we have the water bottle actually have like play into our main story of fate, which is the Kimuras and, and kind of like that, that payoff to him finally saving his family and saving his father by this weird random bottle that, that had kind of come up. Right. I just think that it, it, it was one of those things where it's, it's such a fun beat. And I think it's, it's really fun and, and just stylish and, and kind of like a cool moment. And people always laugh and think it's, it's kind of funny, but at the same time, really, really drives home the idea that like everything, even inanimate objects, you know, in their lives are basically playing into the fate of, of these other characters. And I don't know. I just, I, I think that the way David kind of played it out and made it work, it, it really sells that moment in a way that's a lot of fun because you're cutting away from a very, very serious, tense moment to kind of a silly, you know, uh, a little section. And, but I feel like when it comes back out of that and you know what's going to happen and you know what the payoff is going to be, uh, I feel like audience has always really responded to it in a way that it, it was heightening the moment instead of taking away from it. Well, only because my podcast listeners would give me grief if I don't ask you, because you just brought it up. 
you said you were rewriting the third act a lot. What, what were the elements of the third act that you were really trying to make work? I think it was always just how do we get this to a place that it, it really feels like it's paying off all of these threads. And not only that, but elevating to a place that, that was really fun. And, you know, Ladybug's kind of place in it changed a lot. And, and it had a lot more of a... Um, changed how often Brad Pitt was there? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, literally, like what they were kind of doing. You know, I think kind of late later in the in the filming david had the idea of doing that kind of like suiting up moment where they're all you know making the weapons and they kind of have this conversation about what's waiting for them at kyoto and it kind of all came from that this idea of like we need to really watch this be this this testing of all of these characters and how they get out of it and their individual little moments and arcs and and how do we build that out and then i mean lemon wasn't there for most of it <laughs> because he was dead and then we're like okay how do we have him in it but also you know we don't want this thing. Kelly McCormick's uh, uh, one of the producers on it. And she always jokes that you don't want to have the, the Wizard of Oz ending where you just have all these characters. <laughs> like you have to keep going down the line of like, how do you say bye to these characters? Which is why he ends up falling off halfway through just so we could avoid that a little bit. Right. But yeah, it, it changed so much just because we were trying honestly to make sure it felt right and make sure that we were paying off all these these loose threads in a way that it was going to be, we knew it was going to be big and we knew we wanted it to be this huge crash and, and have it be this, this kind of larger than life moment since the movie had been so larger than life. But at the same time, you know, try and make it work with all the characters and have it feel like it was coming from character stuff as opposed to just coming from. Yeah. That sounds like a tough scene to write during production because you know, the suiting up, you know, you really are taking a pause. It's a pause in action and it's a scene that's redefining character how long did you have to write it? I mean, all of this stuff was, was pretty well, we were getting ready to shoot it. And it was more or less, I think, the same day, shot. not same day, but maybe same week. Okay. Okay. You know, for me personally, like, I think that that moment is the only moment, like I wish was like a little tighter from my writing perspective, because it feels like we build into this third act and then we have kind of like another pause while we're kind of having this conversation. And I think that just, you know, to be honest, I don't know if I ever totally figured out how to balance all these characters kind of having the conversations they needed to have going to this third act but i think that having again kind of having that break going into it really gives you a really great feeling of momentum of like how and it's also the moment like i really love the idea that like ladybug gets off the train for a minute but it's it's like that is still his plan he gets off the train but now it's to confront the white death as opposed to this other stuff that too. totally works uh what was your toughest scene what was the scene that you kept coming back to over and over and how did you creatively rise to the challenge? I mean, I think honestly, it was a, just as we just been talking about, it, I think it was the third act because I just think that there are so many individual scenes throughout that really worked. And then we'd see them get shot. And like even just simple scenes of Lemon and Tangerine kind of having their moments or, or any of the stuff with, you know, I, I love the scene where, where Brad and, and Aaron get off and have to pretend to be brothers and like the, that kind of stuff, like all of that just worked and then when when they did them they've worked even better because we have these incredible people making them work and i think the third act because we were we we're it was very malleable from the start and we we're always kind of trying to figure out how to kind of like jury rig it i think that it changed the most and was definitely the hardest to kind of make sure it was servicing everything that was going on while we were shooting and i i think that we rose to the challenge in the sense that honestly just that trusting david and trusting what i think he, i mean he's successful i think because of the stable of people that he has around him that that he trusts you know he trusts the cinematographer he trusts the stunt people he trusts all these people that kind of like can come together and kind of do their best to make something work i know that there's a scene i want to say it's it's the fight with uh, andrew koji like there's just a really quick fight that he has kind of like on his own while while everything else is happening and i feel like if i remember right they shot that like in six hours <laughs> like choreographed that on the day doing this wow. thing to kind of try to make this work and it, and it feels really good and it works and it feels like he has this moment to kind of like shine and I think that's the thing is like, I wasn't there to work on that because I was working on other stuff and David was working on other stuff. And you have all these people kind of coming together to make this thing work. And I think it really quickly kind of sinks any idea that it's being made by one person who's kind of making this all successful. It is just wild to hear that in your mind, the third act wasn't completely done when the you know movie was greenlit for such a huge budget. Did you know that going in where people saying, yeah, we got to tighten the third act or was it really as you were shooting it, you realized it. Um, I, I think, you know, basically when David kind of came in, he was like, I really like it. I love it. I think that we just want to do more for the third act. Okay. We want to have a big summer movie kind of third act. Whereas mine was very much, you know, a 
they talked and you know there was i think the fight between elder and, and uh white death you didn't even see like it was kind of like in this dark car and and then elder walks out and you realize white death is dead and he was just like no 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 yeah yeah <laughs> we need to do like an actual big kind of thing and right. then a lot of the rewriting was just massaging that and working that and and not only dealing with some of the stuff that had come up during production but also just continuing like how do we make this the best version that it can be like now that we've decided we're going to crash this train and have this big insane thing like how do we not only have that be believable but how do we have that be you know kind of pushing the idea of fate and how do we have it be servicing all these threads so i kind of knew from the start that we were going to have to elevate everything uh, I don't think I knew until the very end, if not later, <laughs> whether it, it worked. But I'm, you know, again, I've, I've seen it a few times, and I, I think it works really well. It definitely works without a doubt. Well, so look, the film came out; it got good reviews. It, it did well at the box office, even in a pandemic. It's still in theaters, so people could see it. What what what's next? What are you working on next? And what what do you think your biggest lesson from the film was? I mean, I, I think what the thing that's really interesting about this industry is you're always kind of looking for not only what's next, but what's next after that next. And you kind of always have to kind of grind and kind of push forward. So I'm hoping next for me is is sleep for a little bit, probably. Uh, and then just you know, I think the thing I really learned from this is honestly just how great it can be working with people who are collaborative and you know david's one of the nicest and most collaborative directors i've ever had the pleasure of working with so and we have other stuff that we're talking through and talking about and i think i think if everyone can just work with people that they they enjoy working with uh it's it's the best work i think you can found good one people have wondered if there could be a sequel could there be i think we'll see <laughs> <laughs> okay okay uh well cool well zach you've been very generous with your time today it was it was great to have you talk about this your your second produced film thanks again for for chatting with us yeah thank you so much i've been a, i've been a huge fan it's it's interesting to uh sit on this side of it after uh having listened to you before i was while well, i was doing coverage back in the day so really yes. that i believe that makes you the 32nd podcast listener who has gone from being a listener with unproduced uh works to to being in the podcast so you are you are number 32 sir congrats on that I feel really good. I'll have to get like a, like a jersey. That's yeah, yes, yes. Or a hat or something. A, yes. a letter opener, maybe. Uh, well, cool. Well, Zach, I can't wait to have you back. Thanks again for your time. Yeah, thank you. And that's how the Q&A went down. Special thanks again to screenwriter Zach Okowitz for being so generous with his time and coming down to chat about his latest film, Bullet Train, which is still in theaters and coming to digital and on demand soon. Of course, I'd also like to thank today's sponsor, ScreenCraft, which you could view over at ScreenCraft.org. ScreenCraft helps writers with both the craft of writing and the business of filmmaking. And you could find everything over at ScreenCraft.org for your writing journey from video lectures with your favorite writers like Tony Gilroy and J.J. Abrams to hands-on career consultative coaching with their writer development team. So look, if you're an aspiring writer, don't wait to check out ScreenCraft. Head on over to Screen craft.org today of course while you're surfing around online i hope you also check out backstory magazine we just turned 10 folks we we lasted a decade and we couldn't have done it without your support and we just published our huge summer issue it has emmy contenders ranging from stranger things barry better call saul hacks what we do in the shadows and station 11 we have actor glenn powell who plays hangman in top gun maverick talking about what it was like to be in that incredible film and his project process. And you know, he's also a screenwriter. There's scripts to read in backstory. There's also an interview with director John Carpenter on the 40th anniversary of the thing. There's so many great pieces in our summer issue and we're continuing to add to it. So it would be fantastic to have you as a subscriber. And of course, to sweeten the deal, if you want to subscribe now, you could use discount coupon code SAVE5. That's SAVE and the number five, and that will save you $5 off a one-year subscription to Backstory. You just enter that code into the shopping cart at Backstory.net and it will give you access to both the iPad app and the website. So look, it would really mean a lot to me to have my podcast listeners and iTunes and Spotify and my YouTube watchers of the Backstory Magazine YouTube page, which is where all these Zoom casts go. That's right. These are Zoom interviews. So you could watch us have these discussions on the Backstory Magazine YouTube page. It would really mean a lot to me to have you consider supporting my passion project. So thanks for considering 
considering becoming a subscriber. The Q&A with Jeff Goldsmith podcast is a copyright of Unlikely Films Incorporated in 2022. All rights reserved. Folks, if you want to find me on social media, you could always find me as Yo Goldsmith on Twitter or Backstory underscore Mag on Twitter. You could also find those same accounts on Instagram. So Yo Goldsmith on Instagram or Backstory underscore Mag on Instagram. You could check out our Facebook fan page or you could even send us an email at BackstoryLetters at gmail.com. That inbox gets a little cluttered sometimes. So I apologize if I don't respond immediately, but I love hearing what folks have to say. And I promise you, I will do my darndest to get to your message. I'm Jeff Goldsmith, the publisher of Backstory Magazine and the host of the Q&A, thanking you for tuning in and telling you to stay out of trouble. Till next week.